Motivation Matters. That's the title of today's talk here. Now, first question, what motivates a person to investigate, I mean sincerely investigate the identity of Christ and then to choose, and to choose Christ? You can know all about Jesus and totally ignore the Bible, totally not follow, you know, not pay attention to the teachings of Christ uh, for a lot of reasons. Ultimately, it comes down to, in your heart of hearts, what do you really want? What do you really want? What do I hunger for the most? That is the question we have to ask ourselves. If I really desire something, I give up things that are valuable to me in order to get them. I'll give up money. I'll give up time. I will trade in resources and even sacrifice some relationships if I really value something. If I don't value it, then I'm not giving up anything for it. Okay? I'm just not, it's not worth it. Okay. But if I think that it's really valuable and it means something to me, then I'll sacrifice something for it. That's how you know what really motivates you. What are you willing to give stuff up for? Now, there are two kinds of motivation. You have extrinsic motivators, and then you have intrinsic motivators. When you were young, when you were a child, you had a bunch of extrinsic motivators. That's part of being a kid. Okay? You can predict what children will do based on your understanding of extrinsic motivators. Uh, for example, what do we like? We like more immediate gratification. Money, pleasure, things like that. Stuff. We're motivated by that. Immediate gratification, acquisition, money, pleasure, and so forth. And what we not like? Pain, shame, and loss. Yuck. Nobody likes those things. Okay? We gravitate away from those. All organisms do. If you're alive, then you, gra you gravitate away things that cause pain. And as a human, with emotions that are rather complex, if something causes you know, uh, guilt and neglect or pain in some way, then, you know, we don't want that. We want to avoid that. And we avoid people who constantly throw stuff in our face we don't want to hear. Okay. So we gravitate away from pain, shame, and loss and towards immediate gratification. So that those are our motivators. You know, here's somebody here who has this child who was born with syphilis, for example, and it ate away at his face. And so with that, you got pain from the disease, you've got the shame because everybody sees that, okay, and so this is something we want to, we want to, we don't want any illnesses or any embarrassments or anything that's, that people will see as negative. We, we gravitate away from shame and loss and we don't, you know, here's somebody, for example, in the absence of reward, imagine somebody in prison. All they have to look forward to is four glasses of dirty water a day, okay, and a cracker, okay. That is, that's something, that's the absence of reward versus somebody who has an abundance. Those are extrinsic motivators. We want to avoid pain, shame, and loss, and we want to get reward. We want, we want to feel good. Okay. Extrinsic motivators equals immediate gratification. Money, power, treasure, drug, sex, pleasure, anything that makes me feel immediate gratification, those kinds of positive emotions. Right. Those are extrinsic motivators. Intrinsic motivators, that assuming that you grew up, assuming that your brain matured like it's supposed to. And there are substances and situations that can prevent brain maturation. Okay. THC is probably one of the biggest culprits today because in, 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 in an individual under the age of 25, the endocannabinoid system um, basically helps to mediate brain maturation. And if you're exposed to THC prior to the age of 25, you block that. There are two endogenous substances released by the hypothalamus, anandamide and two arachidonic glycerol, and those things orchestrate brain maturation. If you're exposed to THC before age 25, especially in your early teens, then, then it doesn't happen. It blocks brain maturation, and that's how you end up getting Oh, te uh, delta, tetra, delta tetranine cannabis. It's, a, it's, it's what's, in, what's in marijuana. Oh, okay. Uh, it's the active ingredient. It's the main psychoactive ingredient in marijuana. Oh, okay. okay. Sorry about that. No, I'm just... <laughs> no, no, I'm glad you brought it up because okay. if somebody doesn't know what it is, then that, that, oh, that's okay. very important to know. Okay. Yes. So um, it blocks that. And so that's why you can take 
I have relatives who have been smoking marijuana since they were 13, 14, 15 years old. And now that they are in their 30s, still behave like they're in their teens. Okay? It is that bad. Okay? So, but what happens if you have a normal brain and you're raised in a healthy environment? Then you're, you, you shift from predominantly extrinsic motivators, and you never completely lose extrinsic motivation. You still want stuff and you want to avoid pain. But intrinsic motivators play a much bigger role, and they contribute to adult fulfillment. Things like autonomy, mastery, purpose, love, respect from others, self-respect. What is self-respect? Having a clear conscience, unafraid your, to tell yourself and others the truth about your attitudes and behaviors. Okay? That's what self-respect ultimately is. You don't have to lie to yourself or make up stories as to why you do the bad things you do. You can tell yourself the truth and tell others the truth about your behaviors. Okay? And then contentment, awe, gratitude, and joy, those are positive emotions associated with intrinsic motivation. Now I'm going to go through several of these. These are mature things, and if they are present, if these are your motivations and you are moved by these, then it contributes to your fulfillment as an adult. I can't tell you how many people I treat who are young people, but still, they're not children. They're in 20s, 30s, even 40s, and sometimes higher. And all of their values are extrinsic. They have no intrinsic motivators. They're living like a teenager in a grown-up world, and they wonder why they're miserable. They wonder why they're so insecure and anxious and depressed. Well, they have deep-seated unfulfillment because this never went online. Okay? They are, they are, they are, they're not getting, they have met huge holes in intrinsic motivators. Okay? What is autonomy? Well, think about it in terms of a job. Think about it like a career. What, what jobs do people stay at? Do they say, I love this job. I'm never leaving. This is a great job. I like it. What, 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 what do those jobs have in common? Autonomy is a huge factor. Okay. The degree to which a job provides substantial freedom and I, I meant to correct that spelling error. I, <laughs> desecration. <laughs> Discretion. You know, I said to myself yesterday, please correct that. It's not. <laughs> anyway, ignore that spelling error. Okay. All right. Um, on the internet, I'm going to correct that. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> free a substantial freedom and discretion to individual to the individual in scheduling the work and in determining the procedure to be used to to be used in carrying it out. Bottom line is. Is somebody looking over your shoulder, telling you what to do moment to moment, giving you immediate criticism or redirection, then that's not a good job. That's not a job where you have freedom. A good job is one where you're given a project and you're given the freedom to carry that project out using your own creativity and mind. Okay? That's a job we like. We like freedom. We like autonomy. Okay? Uh, we also you know, the, I mentioned here, micromanagement is the opposite of autonomy. And I, you know, I, tell you, I hear this from patients all the time. They, you know, they hate, when they hate their jobs, they have a supervisor who's looking over their shoulder, constantly offering criticism and redirection. Because every 15 minutes, they got to produce or they got to be doing something, they got to be following the script. And whenever they get off script, they get slapped on the hand. People don't like those jobs. Mm. Mastery. Am I utilizing a large portion of my brain to do my job? And does this job allow me to use my creativity and intelligence, past experiences and education, so that I am the best at this? I feel that people can come to me and know, hey, I want that one. You know, well, that's the one who really knows this job and they've been here and they've mastered it and they do it better than anybody. We like that. We like, we like jobs that allow us to use our skills that take advantage of our, and so we get a sense that this is for me, and people recognize that you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the one that really knows this position, that knows this job. I'm using more than 5% of my brain. Okay? A job that doesn't utilize very much of our brain, we perceive that as boring. Okay? That's what a boring job is. You're just doing a mindless thing. You know what? A third grader could do this stupid job. And it doesn't matter how much it pays. If you're only using a tiny fraction of your brain, it's boring. And you don't want to spend eight hours a day being bored. All right? 
All right, so imagine job A, secretly fixing children's cleft palates in poor communities. It pays 150 grand a year versus job B, blowing up balloons for a carnival, but it pays $250,000 a year. Now, if you're in a contract and you have to do this job for five years, and you think, well, after five years, I'll make a lot of money blowing up these balloons. But if you're a grown-up, you're going, that would be torture, <laughs> blowing up balloons for eight hours a day. All right. But the difference is, one of these jobs gives you a sense of purpose. So it pays less, but at the end of the day, you not only have the money, you get a sense that, whoa, I contributed to the happiness of some people. I contributed to improved life. It, it matters. There's a purpose. We would, we would take a pay cut. I mean, if you've grown up, I mean, if, you, if you're on drugs, then the blown up balloons is, hey, <laughs> more, more drugs for me, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so then, but if you're a normal individual and you've matured, most people would, would, would choose the first one because, because it's, it's the purpose factor, okay? All right. Now, uh, which job would you find more appealing? You're a writer for an advertising company currently tasked with writing a script for a television commercial encouraging people to contribute to a charity that fixes cleft palates of children in third world countries, and you're given 10 weeks to produce the script and you're not monitored. You're making $125,000 a year, but nobody's looking over your shoulder, okay? Versus uh, you make $200,000 a year, but you're cold calling people on the phone from your cubicle at the office. All of your calls are monitored to make sure you're following the script word for word. In order to keep from being fired, you need to be speaking to at least 12 customers per hour and receiving contributions from at least 20% of them. This is an actual job, by the way. I actually had somebody who was doing that. And that's where I got the idea from, from, from her example. She hated that job. She absolutely hated it because the carrot and the stick, the carrot and the stick, you want to keep your job? You want to make these big bucks, then this is what you have to do. Your, the, your, your, your supervisor is listening in on all the calls. You do not deviate from the script. You, 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 and this is what you have to produce. And if you don't produce, whack, here's the stick. Versus given the autonomy, given autonomy here, okay? Yeah? I had to do that cold calling when I was a trainee. Is that right? Uh, it's probably the worst thing you can do. It, it, <laughs> I'd rather wash dishes without gloves. Yes, and it, exactly. Washing dishes, you, have, you have more autonomy. And they died. And, yes. And yeah, that lack of autonomy sucks your soul. It does. It's just, it's like, you know, I'm a grown up. I'm a grown up now. I don't want kindergarten supervision. I want the freedom to be a grown up. All right, so extrinsic motivators are carrots and sticks, they appeal to immediate gratification. Intrinsic motivator, autonomy, purpose, passion, belonging, self-knowledge, learning, drive, fun, love, mastery. You know, these are, these are the things that, that, that matter to an actual grown-up, okay? Intrinsic motivator. And the more we are experiencing intrinsic values, the more we are successfully experiencing those, the more fulfilled we are as a person. It fulfills us right down to our souls, okay? And that's, yeah. I hate to keep putting it, but uh, what are your, it kind of goes along with this, what are your thoughts of the hierarchy of needs? Well, Maslow, Maslow, this is, this is almost a whole other presentation, oh. but Maslow presumed people were like animals. That was back, you know, I don't even consider psychiatry as science before 1990. Okay. So everything before 1990, I question a lot. I mean, not everything, but people were really big into psychodynamic stuff and caring, comparing the human brain to animal brains and all this evolutionary thought went into it. And so, you know, based on animals, he, he, he basically prescribed this hierarchy. You know, and, and to some degree, he was right if you stay a child. However, the human brain is more, way more complex than any animal organism. And fulfillment is very important. Even back during that time, there was conflict. Maslow did not speak for all psychiatrists. Viktor Frankl, who wrote Man's Search for Meaning, mm -hmm. um, that he basically contradicted Maslow big time. The difference, both of them were trained by Freud. Okay, both were trained by Freud. Viktor Frankl went into a concentration camp during World War II, and he got a chance to see what happens to people when they are put in in severe, dire circumstances. And what he noticed was that the people who had intrinsic values and who lived in with their intrinsic values, even though 
they were starving to death in a concentration camp. They would give away food to their neighbors if they saw somebody suffering. In the midst of lice and starvation and pain to themselves, they were still giving. The concentration camp didn't alter them. And he says, you know, Maslow is diluted because what matters is, is in the intrinsic values matter the most. Now, people that were thugs, that were alcohol, you know, just lived for pleasure and had substance abuse issues or were in, the, you know, just basically um, selfish individuals prior to going into the concentration camp, well, they thrived in that environment. I mean, they would sell their, their fellow Jews out for an extra piece of bread. They would actually, they were, they were made something called capos. The capos, because a lot of the German guards didn't want to go into the barracks because there were lice. And so they would commission the capos, which were Jewish people, to punish and monitor their own people. And for, for better food, they were worse than the German guards. And after the war, the, the, the Jews you know, executed those guys. I mean, they got, they, when, they, you know, when the tables turned, they, they were the first ones to go. All right? But Viktor Frankl said, you know what? If you were very extrinsic before the concentration camp, then you stayed that way. But for people with intrinsic value, deprivation didn't override purpose and intrinsic values. Okay? And so he very much disagreed with Maslow. Maslow assumed, well, you know what? If you don't have your basic needs, if you don't feel good, if you don't have enough food and water, then you will just you will you will pay everything to get those. You will spiritual needs and purpose, that is secondary. Your animal needs are primary. So yes, once your primary needs are met, then you can think about spirituality and philosophy. But if your primary needs aren't met, you know, you're an animal just like the rest of us. And Frankel said, no, I know from experience that that is bull. That is total bull. Okay? Purpose, mastery, you know, fulfillment. If you've, if you've, if you've discovered that those are valuable before you suffer, then if you're really serious about it, it will maintain you, even though it shortens your life. Okay. Uh, yeah. You could say all of the 12 apostles proved that out. They did. Yeah, you could say that very much indeed. Yeah, that's one of the things that validates Christianity, is that unlike, you know, if you compare Christianity with Islam, for example, um, if you converted to Islam and joined Muhammad's army, you became wealthy. You got to keep four-fifths of whatever you stole from the people you conquered. One fifth goes to the caliphate, one fifth, or four fifths go to you. And so you became wealthy. You join that army, and every farm you sack <laughs> just adds to your, your coffers. Okay? So, hey, refuse and get your head chopped off, join and get wealthy, you know? And so there you go. With Christianity, those that traveled around evangelizing, and the, the apostles all suffered martyrdom. Okay, except for John, who was boy, boiled in oil and died on the island of Patmos. Okay, but the rest of them were all executed. They were not. They were not made wealthy. I mean, there was no 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 wealth to be had for the apostles. Okay, they walked around doing their thing, and they didn't become wealthy. They kept moving. They didn't accumulate that stuff. So there's a big difference. And you're right. You're right. Um, that, that that does validate that quite a bit. And that's kind of where I'm going with this too. Is that. God does not appeal to our entrance. You know, he, yes, he does in, in the sense that he says, you know, you know, look at the birds of the field. They neither, you know, they, they, don't, they don't farm or anything, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Look at the flowers. You know, your, your heavenly Father, you know, you are more important than them, and he's going to take care of your extrinsic needs. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. You'll get your extrinsic things, but your intrinsic needs will be met as well. And Jesus really focused on appealing to your intrinsic motivators. People who, who were not recognizing that intrinsic motivations matter, they didn't come to him. Okay? And he didn't want them. He didn't want those other people. And that's what we're going to see in John chapter 6. He literally was bothered by people who were coming to him for extrinsic needs only. Okay? That's, that's where I'm coming with this. Robert Cloninger, um, I came across him during my residency. And um, sometimes I'll do a personality assessment on patients. And Cloninger's temperament and character inventory is one that I love. It's the most, it, to me, I find it far more comprehensive than other personality assessments. 
And it does a very good job of summing people up. And he, I'm not going to go into all this stuff because um, he covers quite a lot of material. But he was a psychiatrist and a geneticist. Uh, and uh, basically, he talks about self-transcendence. And self-transcendence has to do with how much out of your head do you get. I mean, do you, I mean, it's about your spirituality, your philosophical beliefs, and so forth. Um, spiritual acceptance versus rational materialism. Enlightened versus objective. Idealistic versus practical. Self-forgetful versus uh, self-conscious experience. So this is this is people that score high on self-transcendence tend to have more fulfillment, and that was kind of part of his point. And people who are low in self-transcendence are more superficial, and they tend to have less fulfilling lives. Klein's proposed that self-transcendence leads to mature creativity and spirituality when coupled with high self-directedness. Self-directedness, that's another uh, personality trait. But self, you know, this, this self-transcendence is a big deal, and one of the things that we see in the Gospels is that when people come to come to the Lord, this is this is something that's a part of of of, of, of their of their character, uh, very often. And sometimes people come to the Lord and they're superficial, and this is something that grows as a result of a Holy Spirit's act, activity in their lives. So not everybody is 100 percent, you know, self transcendent, but they, there needs to be a little self transcendence there, or else there would be so little spiritual awareness they wouldn't come to the Lord in the first place. Okay. And there are things that I think everybody has the potential for self-transcendence, some more than others, based on your genetics. However, we can squelch that, we can, we can, we can block that light by the, by the behaviors that we do. If you have somebody that is doing behaviors that result in guilt and shame, and then they don't like that feeling, so what happens if you do something and you feel guilt or shame and you don't like the feeling? What do you do? You have two choices. Either you apologize or try to rectify your crime, or you tell yourself a whopper. You tell yourself a story as to why it was okay. You know, I stole a silver dollar from my cousin, but they had a whole jar of them. They won't miss one. Okay? There you go. Problem solved. Okay? Those are the types of things. If you have a whole lot of those, <laughs> okay, if you spent your whole life, you know, stealing silver dollars from others, doing that, then your conscience is so seared after a while that you're self-transcendent. It's all about you. You're feeding a selfish viewpoint, okay? And one of the things that we're realizing in psychiatry, you know, I've mentioned this before, I think, but we're from a from a psychiatric perspective, our country is in crisis, and it's not just this country; it's throughout the West. And depression is now the number one medical issue throughout the entire Western world because each generation is significantly more de depressed than those before them. I, I've mentioned before that for individuals 60 on up, the likelihood that they would have had major depressive disorder or generalized anxiety by the age of 30 was 1 in 25. Okay. And then we get to people between 40 and 60, it's like 1 in 18. To people between 18 and 29, 1 in 2. And for those under 18, it's significantly more than 50%. That's not including substance abuse disorders. It's not including ADHD. Why would that be? Well, there are many factors. It's a perfect storm. There are, I mean, that's a whole, we're actually writing a book about it if we ever finish it. <laughs> but, um, yeah, there are, it's, it's, there's a, I mean, there's a whole lot of things. I mean, there are multiple factors. It's about diet. It's about the loss of the nuclear family. It's about um, early childhood experiences, the, the, the rise of daycare. Um, I mean, there's, there's all kinds of things. There's just, and, and the change, changes in parenting strategies. All of these things, and, and the digital revolution. All of these, have, they are anti-human brain. That's the problem. The human brain was des divine, designed to develop along certain paradigms. Those, those, those nutrients, those environmental factors that support healthy cognition and, and, and sense of self are being polluted by our culture. And as a result, we have <clears throat> a, a type of starvation and un with many of the, the good things and an excess of the bad things, I mean, in a general rule. But that's, a, that's about a two, two to three hour discussion as to why that is. But there is, a, there, just, there is a whole host. It's like a perfect storm that has come against us. And now we have a suicide epidemic like never before seen in history. 
Okay. And it's just getting worse. It's getting worse. And I really, um, I really don't think we can stop it, to be honest. I think we try to help the people we can, but I don't think we can put the brakes on this, to be honest. Okay. All right. Existential well-being. It sounds like, you know, how good of an atheist are you? <laughs> That's not what existential well-being means. It refers to having a positive sense of meaning and purpose in life and a sense of inner strength. That's what existential well-being, you know, do I, it, it just existing by myself, how fulfilled am I? Okay? So that's what that means. And that's what, ultimately, that's what we want in our patients. But my point here, and bringing this up, is that's what the Lord wants for all of us. That's what he wants for us as his children. He wants us to be fulfilled. He wants us to have enough, not just extrinsic things. He will help us. If we, if we seek him first, he will help us with extrinsic things. But he wants us to experience the full force of the intrinsic. That's what makes us wealthy, secure, and well-balanced individuals. And then eternal life on top of it. That is the package that he wants us to have. That's why he came died on the cross. He didn't want us dying for, he didn't want us suffering for our sins eternally. He wants us to live forever, but also he wants to set up residence inside of every individual so that our intrinsic motivations are satisfied as fully as possible. Okay, that's what he's offering. So for people who just want the extrinsic stuff, he's like, no, 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 that's not what I'm here for. Yeah, that's fine, but if that's all you want, you miss the boat. Okay, and uh, that, that's just it, you just missed it. I want to give you more than just the extrinsics. So with that, let me let me go go through here. I'm sorry, this is all right. All right, John chapter six. Um, first of all, we're gonna watch the, the. I don't know how far we're gonna get today, but let, let's watch the video first here. Um. After this, Jesus went across Lake Galilee, or Lake Tiberias, as it is also called. A large crowd followed him because they had seen his miracles of healing the sick. went up a hill and sat down with his disciples. The time for the Passover festival was near. Jesus looked around and saw that a large crowd was coming to him. He said this to test Philip. Actually, he already knew what he would do. For everyone to have even a little, it would take more than 200 silver coins to buy enough bread. Another one of his disciples, Andrew, who was Simon Peter's brother, said, There is a boy here who has five loaves of barley bread and two fish. They will certainly not be enough for all these people. Make the people sit down. There was a lot of grass there, so all the people sat down. There were about 5,000 men. Jesus took the bread gave thanks to God.
to the people who were sitting there. When they were all full, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces left over. Let us not waste a bit. So they gathered them all and filled twelve baskets with the pieces left over from the five barley loaves which the people had eaten. Seeing this miracle that Jesus had performed, the people there said, Surely this is the prophet who was to come into the world. Jesus knew that they were about to come and seize him in order to make him king by force, so he went off again to the hills by himself. When the people saw the sign that he had done, the sign being he didn't eat, say from five fish and two loaves, he fed probably over 10,000 people. Okay, that's the sign. Uh, they said, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. So they're going, this is the Messiah. This is the one we've been waiting for all this time. All those Old Testament passages about the Lord coming back, it happened. It actually happened. This is, this is the guy. Perceiving that they were about to come to, and take him by force and to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. If I'm going to read that and get a little puzzled as to what? I mean, isn't that a good thing? They're recognizing that this is the Messiah and they want to make him king. I mean, he's at the height of his popularity. you got a crowd of probably over 10,000 people. And they're uh, unanimously agreed. I mean, he's, he's healed for one thing. Before, what, what happened before the feeding of the 5,000? Anybody know what Jesus was doing with all those people before the 5,000? What was he doing with them? He was what? He was healing. Yeah. He was healing every single person that came to him. This is not like those faith healers that hang up, that hang out in tents and, and bring up people to heal. And no, where they, 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 they pick and choose who they're going to heal. Uh-uh. Every single person that came to him was healed. So step one, they were there because they heard he was a healer. That's why they came. They got healed. So he healed all these people, and then it came lunchtime, and he just fed them miraculously. So that's what they're in their head. And they want to now make him king. And Jesus is not, I don't have time for this. And he goes away. He doesn't want to be king. So he somehow, he hides himself. He goes off all by himself. Okay, so he's not impressed with them wanting to make him king. He doesn't really, he doesn't accept their honor that they're giving to him. So what they had in mind was, you know, remember like the Maccabees Wars where the Jewish state tries to overthrow Rome? They think, we're going to do it right this time. Now we have the son of David. We have the Messiah. And now in the Old Testament, Messiah, in, 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 in Isaiah, he is described as the suffering saint who dies for the sins of the world. But the Messiah is also talking about when he comes back, he's going to bring righteousness. And Israel will be in, have an elevated status and he will rule the world from Jerusalem kind of thing. And they're thinking, this is, this, is, this is it. This is the end of the world. And Israel is now going to take its place ahead of Rome and be the ruler of the world. We're going to overcome. And why did they think that? Why did they think that Jesus was going to be this military leader? Well, look at this. I mean, what, 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 are, what, are, what, what, what makes you lose a war? How do you lose a war? You get more of your guys die than the other guys. Okay? How do you lose a war? You run out of resources. You starve to death. You, you run out of weapons, you run out of food, you run out of men. Well, Jesus can bring people back from the dead, dude. Okay? He can bring people back from the dead. So they get cut down, he touches them, boom. Break back up, ready for action. 
and you don't have to, you don't need much money to, for your campaign, the dude can take a few loaves of bread and feed 10,000 people with bread and fish. It's like, we can't lose. We can fight and fight and fight, and we can't lose. Even though the Romans have way more many people, when we kill them, they stay dead. Okay, we're not going to stay dead. And we don't need money for food. And you're going to be king. You're going to be a king like David. And Israel will once again rule the world. Well, they never actually rule the world, but we will. We, now we are because of all those verses about the conquering Messiah. Jesus doesn't want to be that conqueror, so he leaves. He hides himself. All right. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started to cross the sea to Capernaum. Now. We don't know if Jesus told them to do that. If they looked for him and couldn't find him, probably told them, I want you to go on. Just let I'm going to stay here for a while. You go on. Okay, so we don't know, but probably that's what happened. I doubt they would just abandon him there and say, where's Jesus? I don't know. Oh, we're going to go. We're going to, keep, we're going to keep going without him. I doubt that's what they were doing. That probably wouldn't make a lot of sense. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the, at the land to which they were going. So Jesus gets in the boat, and they finish their journey. Now, the other people, um, they knew that Jesus didn't get in the boat with the disciples, so they assumed they were, he was still on their side, okay? So they didn't need the disciples anyway. They just wanted Jesus, who was doing all these miracles. And so when they get up in the morning and he's gone, like, where'd he go? There was only one boat, so how could he have left? So when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? How'd you get here? I mean, the, the, the lake is too big to walk around, so how did you, you'd still be walking if you tried to walk around the Lake Capernaum, so how did you, how'd you do that? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you're seeking me not because you saw signs, because you ate your fill of the loaves. So Jesus is, is being bothered by something. He's like, he totally ignores their question. I walked on the water, dudes, and what are you going to do about it? He didn't, he didn't, he didn't really care about answering their question. Okay? He didn't. He just bypassed that. And he expressed, you know, when, you, you know, when you're bothered by something, you don't hear what people are asking, you. you're just thinking, okay, this has been bothering me for a while, and I need to talk about this. He says, I'm upset. Okay? You guys, you came follow me, not because of all the things I've been saying about being the Messiah and, you know, and, and all this kind of stuff. You, all you're thinking about is right now, your extrinsic needs. You want to be free from Rome, and you, and you, want, you want free food. Okay? You want free food and free health care. That's what this is about, free food and free health care. You think I'm offering Obamacare, and I'm not. All right? This is not why I'm here, free food and free health care. It's bigger than that. I, I, I'm here to help you with the, the intrinsic things. You know, these things are superficial. And so he's kind of, he's kind of, this, he's kind of a little bit upset about this. You ate, not, not because you saw the signs, you, you, you're, you're here because you ate your fill of loaves. This is the least verse. And Jesus answered them and said, most assuredly, I am saying to you, you are seeking me not because you saw attesting miracles, but because you ate the eight of the loaves and were satisfyingly filled. And the message says, Jesus answered, you've come looking for me, not because you saw God in my actions, but because I fed you, filled your stomachs, and for free, okay? Free food. That's why you're here, all right? And that's the, that's the only reason you're here. It's not because, uh, you know, I've come to bring you close to God, to give you eternal life. You're not, you're not uh, recognizing that. And then he goes, stop working for the food which perishes, but work for the food which abides for life eternal, which the Son of Man will give you. For this one, the Father sealed, even God. He says, you know, I'm here on a specific mission. I'm here to give you eternal life. I'm here to give you food that doesn't last, or that, doesn't, that doesn't end. And all you care about is the free food. Don't, and the message says, don't waste your energy striving for perishable food like that. Work for food that sticks with you, food that nourishes your lasting life, food the Son of Man provides. He and what he does are guaranteed by the Father to last. To that they said, well, what do we do then to get in on God's works? So he just explained, I'm here to give you long-lasting things, eternal things, things that will really satisfy your soul. And, the, and, the, and what, they, what they hear is, 
I want you to be able to make food whenever you want. I mean, I, I, here's a recipe. You too can make free food. Something. How can we? How can we get on these? How, how can we get in on these miracles? All they're hearing is more free stuff, more miracles. Okay. Then they said, to him, "What are we to do as a habit of life in order that we may continually be working the works of God? Can we do this? How do you? How do you? How do we do this?" They're still stuck in their heads about free food and free health care. Jesus said, throw in your lot with the one that God has sent. That kind of a commitment gets you in on God's works. And then we it says, answering Jesus then said to them, this is the work of God, that you continually be believing on him whom that one sent off on a mission. I was sent on a mission. Okay, what do you have to do? You have to be continually believing what I say. The words that I'm speaking come from God. Listen to what I'm saying. Right now, you've got miracles in your eyeballs. All you're thinking about is free stuff and miracles. All right? that, that's, that, that's an attesting miracle that I came from God. I'm on a mission. Get it through your head. I'm here on a mission. All right. This is my mission. And these words that I'm saying, these are the things that are going to change your life. Then they said to him, uh, What therefore are you performing as an attesting miracle in order that we may come and, and to see and believe you? What are you working? Our fathers ate manna in the deserted region, even as it stands written, bread out of heaven he gave them to eat. In other words, they're saying, uh, Okay, if you want us to believe you and keep believing you, then we would like to see manna come from heaven, just like Moses did. If you can do that, then you're right, we'll follow you. Okay? Now Jesus, think about what he just did. So, you just saw me take a few loaves and fish and feed like 10,000 people. And you want another miracle? You want Now you want bread. So basically, I fed you dinner last night, now you want breakfast. That's why I'm here. You want, But you want to come a different way. You want to see the mad thing coming out here. So we want to see another. If you want us to, so they're saying, okay, if you want us to hang on to your every word, like you just said, then here's the miracle we'd like you to do. Then Jesus said to them, most assuredly I'm saying to you, it was, not Mo it, was, it was not Moses who gave you the bread out of heaven, but my Father gives you the bread out of heaven, that which is genuine. He says, look, the bread out of heaven, that, Mo that, that was from God, but right now the Father is giving you the bread out of heaven. Manna came from the sky, okay? Uh, this is from, this is actually me. I am the bread that came down out of heaven, literally. I literally came out of heaven, literally, okay? Literally came out of heaven to you. All right? I am the bread that comes down. You want manna? Some, this is so much bigger than stupid manna. That's what he's saying here. Manna, that's, that's children's stuff. You, you, this is way bigger. You know? You know, basically, you know, I'm giving you a brand new car and you're asking for a freaking tricycle. Okay? I am the bread that came out of heaven. Okay? For the bread of God is he who comes down of, out of heaven and gives life to the world. They said, therefore, to him, Lord, give us this bread. Ever give us this bread. Jesus said to them, I alone, in contradistinction to all others, am the bread of the life. He who comes to me shall positively not become hungry. And he who places his trust in me shall positively never thirst. So what they're asking for is free health care and stuff, free bread, and Jesus is saying, I want to offer you the intrinsic things plus eternal life with God and soul fulfillment. I am the bread that comes out of heaven that gives you everything. And you're asking for something so much less. And that's bothering me. Okay? So that's where we're going to leave off here. Um, we've got more to cover, but not enough time to do the whole thing. So that's where we're split it up. But again... You just wanted to leave, you know, keep in the forefront of your mind that difference between intrinsic and external motivations. And for the immature individual, it's all about the extrinsics. Everything. That's all. That's all they care about. And if a person's motivation is a hundred percent extrinsic, they're not coming to God. Yeah. Aren't you kind of just saying that things things don't make you happy? That's that's yeah, in a nutshell, absolutely. I mean, that's really they weird. don't fulfill. Stuff doesn't Stuff fulfill. Doesn't that's like happen. thinking. I mean, is it okay? Yeah. I mean, water is good, but without food, okay. You need both. You need both. All right. And he says, look, you know, if, if all you all you're thinking about is extrinsic, you will be an unfulfilled individual. You know, I treat severe major depressive disorder with my transcranial magnetic stimulation, 
And I, I notice that some people just don't get better. And the people that really don't get better are those who are, they're like 100% extrinsic. You know, they, want, they won't be happy until life is on their terms, until they get to be voted God and they're in control because every little thing, you know, they want the extrinsics. And if the extrinsic things aren't there, you know, they want the, they want the income, they want the, to be in a certain type of relationship, they have to have a certain house. If things aren't like that, then happiness is up there. They're, they're frustrated and they'll never be happy. You, you've, got, they, you've got to acknowledge the intrinsic values and grow in those for, in order for fulfillment to come. And that's what God wants for everybody. That's what he's offering. Not just he'll give us enough food, clothing, and shelter. He'll take care of those things. But he wants more than that. And for those who don't care about those other things, um, they're going to have a very limited relationship with God, if any at all. Okay. All right, let's close with yeah. Um, most of the disciples were probably under 20, so wouldn't it be natural? Not necessarily. No, 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 I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that they were mostly under 20. Oh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't go there. I, we don't know. Yeah. Why would you think that they were mostly under twenty? Um, Perhaps John was. You know. But the rest of them, I, I really, I wouldn't say that. Well, it's another Bible study. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think the, that um, you know some of them were young. I mean, you know, because we get the, you know they were still with their father working and everything. But we're not given exact ages. But I mean, James and John were probably younger. Uh, Peter and Andrew, possibly, you know, but we just we just don't know. But some of these other guys, uh, I, don't, I don't know. Well, Peter was married. Yeah, he was. He had a mother-in-law and everything. Back then, he got married at 15, though, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. My father had three kids by the time he was 17. <laughs> All right, let's, uh, let's close the prayer here.